In this video, I'm going to briefly explain how stress intensity factors were first arrived, and as such, what they represent. I have kept this video short, so it may help if you pause at key moments to look at the equations. On the screen you can see a grey square with a surrounding dashed line. This represents a block of linear elastic material, and despite the boundary shown, it is of infinite extent. As with all linear elastics, two constants describe how this deforms due to a given stress. Now there is a hole inside the elastic, with its shape defined by two semi-axes, A and B, which are of equal length. The body here is plane strain, i.e. the hole is actually a cylindrical tube of infinite length. If we apply a far field stress, sigma, along the vertical axis, we see the following stress concentration on the wall of the hole. This is three times the applied stress. This solution was first derived in 1898 by Ernst Gustav Kirsch. If the size of the hole is changed, the stress concentration doesn't change. This concentration is also independent of the elastic constants. If the remote stress is changed, the stress concentration at the wall increases, but this remains three times the applied stress. If the semi-axis A is changed and B is held constant, we see the stress concentration changes, where this is proportional to the square root of A over rho, where rho is the radius of the hole's curvature at the location of the stress concentration. You can see the solution will reduce to 3 sigma when the hole is circular. The same is true if A is held constant and B is changed. The solution for the stress distribution surrounding elliptical holes was first published by Charles Inglis in 1913, and as I will show, is an important step in understanding stress at a fracture's tip. As you can see, much like the Kirsch solution, when the hole's size changes but the ratio between the semi-axes remains constant, the stress concentration also remains constant. Two things of note in this solution are that the stress concentration is linearly related to the driving stress and also to the square root of A. Now as the hole is reduced to a crack and the radius of curvature rho drops to zero, then the denominator is zero. And as such, the stress concentration at the wall is infinite. This is really where the maths becomes more complex. What happens when we increase or decrease the driving stress? Clearly, this infinite concentration must become greater or smaller. Using the insight from the analysis of Inglis, we can assume this is linearly related to the driving stress. If we increase the crack length, again the stress concentration must be greater. Assuming the relationship defined by Inglis holds, it must be proportional to the square root of A. We will look at this in more detail by finding a solution that describes stress at a point surrounding the fracture's plane. Firstly, I introduce the axes used in this solution, x and y. Here, the crack lies along y equals 0 from minus a to plus a in x, i.e. the crack has half length, a. This solution relies on complex numbers with the plane z as shown. Using airy stress functions, we can find the solution to this problem. I'm not going to show how airy stress functions are derived or defined in the context of linear elasticity, as it's beyond the scope of this video. I know the conditions and derivation can be found in textbooks linked to in the video notes. The stress function we use is as shown. This was first described in the work of Westergaard, 1939. And, as with such functions, it's not particularly obvious what this does at first glance but it's safe to say this function satisfies the requirements of an airy stress function in a medium subject to plane strain conditions. Using an airy stress function in 2D, the stress components can be found using combinations of the real and imaginary parts of the function zeta. This stress function can be transformed to tripolar coordinates using the following equations, with the resulting function written as I find this function a little more intuitive, and it can be visualised as shown. 
Aside from the driving stress, this is dependent on the radial lengths away from the two tips and the crack's center, as well as the angle of each of these vectors away from the crack's plane. It's clear here that when R1 or R2 are zero, then the stress concentration is infinite, as in the English solution. Here we can see that the real components of the stress function affect stress components sigma xx, sigma yy, and sigma xy, whereas the imaginary ones only affect sigma xx and sigma yy. These imaginary components are also related to the value of y, which gives an indication that if no real parts of the stress function exist in the plane of the crack, then the stresses will be zero. Now we're going to explore the space to see how the stress function changes. As we get far away from the crack, we can see that the real component goes to 1, and the imaginary component tends towards 0. This means that far from the crack, only sigma xx and sigma yy are equal to 1. This represents the remote driving stress, which must be biaxial. Note that here, I've drawn this as uniaxial, as I've neglected to draw the remote stress along the x-axis. As we move towards the fracture's tip, we see that the stress sharply increases. Then this drops to zero once we start moving along the fracture's plane. This is the stress condition that the fracture's surface is traction free. So now we have seen that the stress function satisfies the boundary conditions. It's also of note that this function includes the infinite stress at the tips of the crack and matches the stresses of the English solution in the surrounding body. I will now show how the stresses at the tip of the crack can be approximated. So we travel over to the right hand tip of the crack. The derivation I'm about to show was first performed in the seminal work of George R. Irwin in 1957. When evaluating the stresses close to the right hand tip of the crack, the distance to the left tip is approximately 2a, and to the center of the crack it is a. So we replace these in the stress function for the respective values of a. Now rearranging this, it becomes immediately clear that in the numerator are the stress concentrations we hypothesized existed at this tip earlier. The stress at the tip is related to sigma times the square root of a. Additionally, we can now see how this decays by a factor of 1 over the square root of r, the radial distance from the tip. To simplify this even further, when close to this tip, the angles theta and theta2 are close to zero, so these are dropped out. Now if we draw the elements required for the new stress function, we can see that these are the radial distance away from the right hand tip and the angle away from the fracture's plane. If we expand and write out the Cartesian stress components from this stress function, the following result is found. Here I have replaced the terms in the numerator with k. This value is the stress intensity factor, and it holds all the information related to the driving stress and fractures geometry. The actual stress state is described by all the other terms. You can see that in the stress components, r only changes the magnitude of stress by 1 over the square root of r. It's of note that these are commonly written with the square root of pi in the numerator and denominator as shown. This makes it so that k can easily be related to equations describing energy release rates. Now if we visualize the hoop stress around the fracture's tip, you can see this is zero on the crack plane and reaches its peak in front of the tip itself. To quote Paris and C from 1965, the surface of a crack, since they are stress-free boundaries of the body near a crack tip, are the dominating influence on the distribution of stresses in that vicinity. Other remote boundaries and loading forces affect only the intensity of the local stress field.